Hey guys, what's going on? This is Bobby Barrick from Bobby Barrick's Bass Class on YouTube. And I was fortunate enough to wrestle this guy down, Brian Branham, one of the premier guides out here on Sam Rayburn. And we're talking about swim jigs. At swim jig, spawn, post-spawn time, when them fish don't like that big movement, a lot of erratic stuff, something a little more subtle, something a little more stealthy coming through the water. He's a, he's a master lure designer, uh, been designing hooks, been designing jigs, been designing just lures, baits of all different kinds forever. And we stepped into his office the other day, last night actually, and uh, we're gonna show you some of that and where it all goes down, where it all happens, you know, all the, all the creativity. And uh, so now we're out here today and we're gonna put some of that knowledge, all that just decades of knowledge to use. And uh, I'm gonna show you how to get it done with the swim jig, Brian Branham style. Stay tuned. I know there's some in that really thick skinny water. Those probably fry garters. There he's got a little bit of everything. You got fry garters up heavy and shallow where the fry go and almost no water. And then these larger fish, it's five, six foot deep out here on these big hay balls or torpedo grass balls and wound up parts of it out here and they just suspend in that. There's no reason for those females to really get out of here yet. A lot of food in the shallows. Not to interrupt him, but that's one of the prettier bass boats that I've ever seen on the doggone lake right there. <laughs> Isn't that a gorgeous boat over there, Brian? That's really Man, that's a sexy boat over there. I mean, your swim jig stuff is amazing and all that kind of stuff, but I'm kind of focused on that boat over there. The guy that's fishing out of that boat is not one of the more attractive people that you're probably ever gonna see on the lake. Hey, you! Can you keep your social distancing a little? Can we move it down the bank a little ways, please? You're encroaching on our spot. That is a sexy boat there, partner. You LSU fan? I'm glad you like it. Are you a fan of the LSU Tigers? I'm a fisher. They're handmade. Hey folks, what's going on? This is an absolute treat. I'm up here at Sam Rayburn Reservoir and I got Brian Branham here, master designer. I worked for Stanley Jigs in the 80s building jigs while I was in college. That's 30. I graduated in 86, engineering degree. So let's just say 35 years I was working building jigs. A lot of guys don't understand why they like what they like. This guy does every aspect of it. The angle of the eye. How many of you guys take into consideration the angle, the angle of the eye that comes off of the jig head? The angle of the eye. Is it this way? Is it this way? Is it this way? Sometimes too much is not good. Sometimes it makes it wiggle like this. Sometimes it gives it a finer wobble. All that stuff. And then the hook that you put in it, the angle of all of that stuff. We guard, we guard diameter, number of pieces of we guard, uh, pure nylon we guard versus big. And I mic the we guards to see how big they are. This one's a one nine. This one's a little close to the same, but I, they're supposed to be 016 to 018. These have a speck. These are pure nylon weed guards. They come in pieces as tall as I am, all together like this. And then we burn the ends of them after they come through a round enclosure so they stay together when we put them in the jig. And we use a certain epoxy to hold them in there real good so you're just never going to be the problem. I mean, this goes on and on. Lead, lead mixed with tin, density of the lead. Um, you know, there's a lot to every single one of them, and I'm the kind of guy that looks at every bit of it. What's your favorite size swim jig, Brian? Um, I only use one the majority of the year, and it's 5 sixteenths. It's this one that we're making and selling. And this is made of pure lead ingots. I mean, there's no tin or antimony or bismuth or anything. These are pure lead. So the size of the head is relatively small. Well, they mix tin 
T-I-N with lead when they make large quantities of these because the tin acts like a, a lubricant in a spin cast mold. We're hand pouring these so we can use real straight lead. And uh, pure lead is mixed with about 18% tin. Tin has a density of 7.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Lead has a density of 11.3 grams per cubic centimeter. So when you mix those together, you get somewhere between 7.3 and 11.3 grams per cubic centimeter. To give you an idea of where you're at there, tungsten is 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. But you can't melt tungsten and pour it in a mold because it takes 6,000 degrees to melt the tungsten. It would melt the mold, the lead, the hook, everything. You just can't do that. That's not how tungsten's made. But lead is the best option. Bradley showed up. Yeah, there's Brad. Brad, Brad, neighbor Brad's here. He puts up with my late night jig building. Max is here too. There's a Max. Max. Max is a jig dog. That's one of the first things that I learned about this lake, this legendary lake, Sam Rayburn. These guys, these aren't your typical run-of-the-mill, average, everyday bass fishermen. They're, they're not. These are the guys that are the engineers, are the designers, are the R&D guys that find out what works, not today, but over the long haul, and then they put it into production. They put it in they put it into the industry because they've got that kind of pool, that kind of juice. We're talking about swim jigs here tonight in particular. I do make football jigs and other jigs, and I've designed jigs for three or four major companies, but swim jigs dear to my heart. I was on a, uh, I was actually fishing co-angler in 2000 up in Wisconsin in La Crosse. They were using a little swim jig, but it didn't have a hook or anything necessary to land fish here. So it's a 20 year old deal what I'm doing here. I still make these jigs out of a handmade jig mold. There's the that's the thing that keeps the weed guard spot. And if you'll notice that fits right in there. And there's where you pour it. Anyway this mold is about a thousand jigs old, that's about all they last. And that, it's really not important how the mold works, but they are made by hand, the molds. Bondo, acrylic resin, things like that. But this is a Mustad double X hook and a really large keeper. It's all hand painted, powder painted, hand dotted eyes. This is a finished handmade jig that I make. And um, it may not be the prettiest jig you've ever seen, but this is extremely functional from the weed guard angle to the number of weed guard. You know, when you trim a weed guard, you should trim it where the longest piece is the length of the barb and the shortest piece is the length of the hook point. Now, I do that pretty quick because I've been doing it a long time, but that's that's the way you should treat that's the way you should trim your swim jigs a lot of other jigs i trim the same way and then i fan them out a little bit so when they come over something that helps bump the hook off so that's a pretty good spread for a weed guard trim right there now i actually on my own angle the last couple on the sides because nothing in nature is straight across, okay? Everything in nature is a little bit staggered. You just don't see many straight lines in nature, so I don't like straight across weed guard, but that's a, that's a real good weed guard. That's 26 pieces of .019 weed guard. It's on every one. Every single one of those, that's where they're made. And I was gonna make this one for Bobby, and get him to fish it for me and tell me what he thinks. This is a living rubber skirt. Doesn't look like a skirt. It will in a moment. And I, all of these jigs are hand tied. Hand tied with rubber. That's the way I was taught. Lonnie Stanley actually patented hand tied with rubber skirts back in the 80s. No one builds them this way anymore. But this is the way you do it. 
and you want to do it this way because you don't want your skirt to ever move once you get it trimmed good and this is um, actually I use floral wire it's, it's coated steel and then I uh, tighten each one up about half a turn after I wrap it by hand and then I use another little cutter and I leave quite a few little turns there and then wrap it right below the weed guard so that doesn't get in the way of your line. Most of these are fished on Brady line. Now you'll see that I'm separating the skirt a little bit, but um, this is how old school living rubber skirts are made. If you, if you notice, it's already got a serrated skirt. So now it's starting to look like a skirt. Um, Notice how each one of those, as you cut it, the serrated little pieces fly back over it one at a time. So now Bobby's swim jig, that I just asked him over because I wanted to give him one. Um, this is very impromptu here. Uh, that's how the skirt looks when you first cut it. And that's that's living rubber. This stuff here, when you it's square in profile. You can feel it when you roll it. Roll roll that. Feel it. Brian uh, around. Brian, what's the benefit of living rubber as opposed to silicone? Well, silicone skirts, they kind of lay back on the bait like this, and they just don't move. It just moves through the water. They lay back like greasy hair on a head or something. Rubber undulates it, it continues to move and because it's square it won't roll and stay rolled it'll keep coming back to its same square form so if you just look at both of them beside each other there's no explanation necessary I mean this is a living rubber skirt and that's why they call it living rubber but um, first thing trimming a skirt is like second nature to me I put them all about that long from the hook some people do it differently but just like I said, in nature, nothing is squared off like that. I, I turn it at two different angles and cut an angle. And I'll reach up in there and get a couple of pieces so that it's all kind of different things, like a shag haircut. So that when you put a trailer on there, the skirt does not impede the action of a trailer. If you put a boot tail shad trailer on there, you want to do this. If you put a flapping type trailer on there, you don't want these when they're getting pulled by the water to hit that flapping trailer. And occasionally during your fishing, you need to refan your skirt. Here's what we throw in. One of the reasons that's happening is the weed guard has gotten back to where it's not flared. Flare that weed guard out. Grab that hay as easily. And this jig in particular, it's designed with two flats here so that it can't really come out of a fish's mouth without being turned at one angle or another. You want it either down or up when you pull. And a lot of jigs are, are symmetrical. Well, you really don't want that. You want, you can see both eyes from the top. That's because they're angled this way. So when you pull out of a fish's mouth, generally speaking, it's gonna go against one flat or the other, and therefore the hook will be in the top or the bottom. I mean, it's, it's micro thinking, but everything matters these days. I'm telling you, this has been this way a very long time. With this particular head design, you can throw it without even watching over pretty much anything from our torpedo grass, which a lot of people call hay here on the lake, pre uh, predominant bank cover here, to mixed logs, buck brush, whatever. You don't even need to be looking. When you're reeling that jig, it's gonna come right through that stuff. In swim jig fishing, those are very different. Okay, this is the one I use most of the time. This is the one I use post-spawn and right before the spawn when the fish are really trying to get a mouthful. And I always cut this thing 
the same. A little bit of an angle on one side. This is a big, heavy, bulky trailer. We've already seen that these fish are active and they're not, I'm saying there's about half of them are hooking up and it's not because they're not hungry. I think it's because they're, they don't have enough to pull to them. They'll, they'll eat this bait better, hopefully, because it's a lot more lure to suck into their mouth. We've caught some, but this one's going to do an entirely different thing. It's providing a really big target of a mouthful, as you say. Occasionally you'll get it where, like this one right here, the bait is turning. So I have to adjust the lure that far off where it's straight. And then one side of it you clip like that so that it water hits this side but it flows on that side. Now that's matted vegetation over there and that's the strength of a swim jig. You can throw it anywhere almost. This one's working really right for what I'm wanting. There's stumps in the water. You can see the black spots over there. And in this time of the day, there's often a good one along through there. But nice. That's a little bitty guy. That's a Kentucky bass. Because there's no small ones in this. That happens sometimes. Nice. Swim jig special. Get your tip up high. Typical Raven swim jig fish. There's a lot of advantages to using a handmade jig. This is a handmade jig from the top to the bottom. This is a 5 aught hook. I use a 4 aught hook a lot myself. I mean, it's the same thickness here, but it's shorter here and it has a little bit less leverage for the fish and it doesn't grab as much cover and that little bit that it's smaller in the bite does not seem to matter. This is something I've gone to in recent years um, especially fishing our torpedo grass, what everybody calls hay on this lake. A 4 aught hook in this can literally land on a long cast on that hay and just pick it up and start reeling sort of like a hollow body frog. The 5 aught hook, it's a great hook and everything, but it's wider and bigger and sticks back a little bit farther and occasionally it grabs that hay grass when the 4 aught hook would not. And the 4 aught hook is actually stronger. I mean, it's the same diameter, but because it has less thickness, less distance here to here, it has less leverage. If I had a hook out here, I could just straighten it. The closer in, the harder it is to bend. So the 5 aught has been a big deal and we really enjoyed using it when we weren't having to fish such heavy cover, but I'm using a 4 aught must add 30 degree hook some. And especially during the shad spawn when the fish are up in the, the torpedo grass and some other um, cover. Now in hydrilla, I'm using a 5 aught hook every single time I fish because even if you have a piece of the hook sticking out this much from the fish's mouth after he's hooked, it's not going to matter with hydrilla. You're just going to pull it right through. But if that stuff is like that ropey hay and it gets hung on there, you're hung up with the fish, even though you've got him hooked good, and somehow they know how to back off of that. You don't want that. You put a bulky trailer on one, it's even more weedless, and it skips better. And the fish have more to inhale. You put a skinny trailer that flops. It has a lot better action for when you're throwing it further from the cover. But in my opinion, the swim jig should not be used unless it's going within inches of the cover you're fishing. If it's not going within inches of the cover you're fishing, there's a better bait to be thrown. A prettier bait, a more natural bait, a bait that's better for what you're doing. But if your bait is literally going through cover that's within an inch or two away, that's when a swim jig's right thing. Hey, so I'm fixing to get out of here, and this guy hands me this jig right here, 
and then he goes into this long explanation as to why he would use this, why he wouldn't use this, and then he's telling me about this, and then he says, but the black one with the red eyes is the one he'll use if the money's up. You explain to these people what you just explained to me. Well, you know, I knew, Here, I, here's I, your two I, little I deal. use this exact, I, I've designed this jig in various forms for more than one company. Gambler has a version of it, and Santone has a version of it, and they're excellent lures, and I love them both. But when I hand make them, I only, back up a second, I only asked them to build one color scheme that I wanted, both of them. And um, this is the color scheme I asked them to build for me. Santone calls it white shadow, but Really and truly, when it comes down to what I use when the chips are down, if I was competing or something, I use a black head and a black weed guard. I don't really, I really can't explain it, but over the years, I have seen by looking at shad in the water and my results fishing and so on, the shad generally have a really dark head and dark forward top, and the rest of them looks kind of light colored. And um, this, this red eyed black, black weed guard bait is the one that I prefer when I really need to perform on a big bass. I've caught way more on this one, but for some reason when it's time to catch a big one and still get a good limit, I use the black head. It's just contrast. It's what I believe is that you get a contrast. Lonnie, Lonnie Stanley has a lot of impact on my fishing over the years because I worked for him during college. And he used to talk about contrast all the time with a Stanley jig. He used green and black jig, green and blue trailer. Green and blue jig, green and black trailer. I mean, he never used a homogenous color bait. So, I have gone to use this. It looks like the black part of the top of the shad, the black front of the shad. And oftentimes on my all-white trailer, I'll do a little black towards the rear. Um, it's just a personal favorite. I'm not saying it's best for everybody. And there's a lot of colors of swim jigs. These are just the ones that I use. I mean, we, we make um, green pumpkin and perch colors. This specific one is for a very well-known fisherman I'm making them for. Um, all of these are for a person that you all would have heard of, I promise you, and they're all variations of, of perch colors. This one has a little green, this one has a little brown. They're all variations of green pumpkin and watermelon. And, you know, that's what he wants. That's fine. I mean, I think it's for fishing really clear water, but I don't know. I mean, that's full-time professional has a lot of, a lot of needs that I don't. I, I fish the swim jig as a white flash. I mean, it's, it's just a teaser. I mean, a shad coming through, a bass only has a window of six or eight or inches or a foot of the bait coming through. It's just a reaction. And you got a big hook, braided line, a big trailer, so you suck it in good. You know, who could want more than to have a big fish hooked on 65 pound braid? seven foot heavy rod and a five odd triple x hook i mean it's right next to flipping you know over the years my my ratio of landing fish is goes up the closer they are when i hook them and the bigger the line i got the bigger the hook i got you know just in the boat way out there somewhere on a little line everybody knows that you know your ratio goes down the swim jig is a lot like flipping it really is you're throwing that you're throwing that swim jig with primarily braid. Do you generally ever use floral? Speaking, generally speaking, I never throw a swim jig on anything but braided line. Sometimes I go down off the 65, but I want to be able to put a hook in them. It's a big hook, heavy cover where I live. I mean, I just fish here, so you know, Sam River is a big fish place. I don't want to get stuck on a heavy cover with 20 pound line. I mean, it break off easy here on that. It's not the fish and open water, it's the fish, the cover, and all the different stuff moving and swinging around. Now, during the winter here, I have gone to slow rolling a swim jig that I build with a smaller hook diameter that would not withstand fishing at other times of year because the fish are warm and they fight harder. But in the winter, we slow roll jigs through the top of the hydrilla 
and I use fluorocarbon for that. It's no problem hooking them or landing them. Um, they're just reduced in their ability to resist being caught because their body temperature is so low. I know there's a lot of people out there that are, that are intrigued with the swimming thing, maybe a very good swimming fish, or maybe have never done it but want to do it. How can they get their hands on some of those? Well, uh, just call me. I mean, it's a handmade lure. It's kind of a local thing, but people can buy them. Uh, the jigs are $7 each. And call me to get them. They'll come with this little rubber skirt. Awesome. So this is like a limited edition. Because <laughs> these, once they're gone, they're gone. So if you want to get your hands on some of these here, get in touch with Brian. I'll tell you what, there's not a better black bass guide, and he's doing the crappie. He doesn't like to talk about it, but he does a lot of crappie stuff too here on Sam Rayburn. Right here, Brian Branham. Hope you learned something. I'm sure you did. Well, come see us. Got big nice pants, boat, and all. Go on the lake, come take you out and show you. Awesome. Thanks for watching.